mortar flotilla and its connection with the bombardment and capture of Forts Jackson and St. Philip. A paper read by Lieutenant George W. Brown, late U.S. Navy, at a meeting of the Commandery, State of New York, Military Order, Loyal Legion, May 2, 1888. During the latter part of the year, 1861, Commander, now Admiral David D. Porter, conceived the idea of using seacoast mortars afloat for the reduction of forts. Consequently, some 20 schooners that had been purchased for light cruisers were fitted out with one 13-inch mortar each, and from two to four guns broadside. The preparation of these vessels to carry and use this heavy piece of ordnance required very great care. They were filled and almost solid from the ceiling to the deck with heavy timber to enable the deck to withstand the effects of the recoil and concussion. The mortars or chowder pots, as they were generally dubbed, measured about four feet across the muzzle and say five feet in length and weighed 18,000 pounds. The carriage of iron about 10,000 pounds and the bed or table 7,000 pounds. In all about 16 or 17 tons. The vessels varied from 160 to 250 tons and carried a crew of about 40 men each. The ship sailed from New York for Key West during the month of January 1862. I was the first officer ordered to the command of either of these vessels, and having my choice, I selected one of the smallest, the Dan Smith, a schooner built for the fruit trade, and very fast, in fact, the best sailor of the fleet. The mortar, a vast chunk of iron on a carriage and then on a turntable mounted on eccentric rollers, brought the ponderous weight high up from the deck and was a cause of no little concern during the first gale of wind which we encountered in the Gulf a few days after leaving New York. I took notice that no one liked to pass the leeward of it when the vessel was lying over much. In other words, they would always kept to windward. Among the crew, shipped in New York, was a landsman from the Emerald Isle by the name of Pat, who had served three months in the army. As Pat was not sailor enough to take the wheel, and was no use aloft, not knowing the jib downhaul from the foresheet. His turn at the lookout came very often. One night, while in cold weather, he came on deck from his warm hammock and was stationed on the weather bow to keep a sharp lookout. Just then we shipped a heavy sea over the bow, drenched poor Pat to the skin. This was not relished by Pat, and he gave vent to his displeasure with, Oh, holy Moses! The devil take me friend sure, and me friends advise me to go to sea in the navy, and not go in the army again, for a sailor says, they always has a house over his head. But the very devil was in them when they give me that advice, sure. I have skipped some of the hard words that he said from time to time, as he got ducked during his looking hour that night. There were some very interesting adventures during the trip, but time will not allow me to relate them here. I will only mention this. One afternoon a sail was sighted. I kept off for her, and soon discovered that it was a bark, heading nearly the same course as ourselves and carrying full sail. As I changed my course to near her, she changed to avoid me. This at once looked suspicious, and we all smelled prize money. The breeze that had been moderate began to freshen, and the little Dan Smith cut through the water lively. Change of wind brought the stranger to windward, to his advantage, and he tacked ship. I after him, the wind increasing to half a gale, yet I carried sail until the water stood on deck halfway to the hatches before I reefed. Squalls of rain during the night would obscure the stranger, and he would change his course to escape us. Thus all night the chase continued, all hands on deck, their palms itching to get hold of the prize, for surely it must be a blockade runner, or why this dodging? About eight o'clock in the morning, we overhauled her, and very much to our surprise and disgust, she proved to be the Snapdragon from New York, loaded with quartermaster stores for Tatugas. Her captain had thought her little rakish schooner was a rebel privateer, and used his best efforts to escape capture. Of course, both felt tired and mad as we had run fully 100 miles out of our course in the chase. The fleet rendezvoused at Key West and thence to Ship Island. While waiting for Farragut's fleet, the mortar schooners were ordered to by turns to make short cruises along the west Gulf Coast. One morning while we were cruising off Mobile, a steamer was sighted heading offshore, and we gave chase. The breeze was just what we wanted for all sail, and we soon found that we were gaining on the steamer. I shifted one of my 12-pound rifles forward and opened fire on her. As good luck would have it, we landed a shell in her deck load of cotton, for this was, in truth, a blockade runner. She began throwing cotton overboard to lighten ship to escape us, as we were gain gaining fast. Again the palms itched, and Jack began to calculate what his share might be. When, oh, fickle fortune, the wind dropped like a wet blanket on our prize, hoisted the stars and bars, and steamed away. We, however, lowered our boats and picked up a deck load of cotton and returned to Ship Island. The boys made about three months' wages out of this capture. Shortly afterward, we sailed forward and entered the Mississippi, preparatory to the attack on Forts Jackson and St. Philip.
A little incident, which proved of great value, happened while waiting at the Southwest Pass for orders to proceed up the river. My vessel was alone. Others either had not arrived or had already gone up the river. When we left New York as a precaution, we were ordered under no circumstances to cast loose the mortar or fire it at sea, as if by an accident it got adrift with any position on it. It would endanger the vessel being capsized. In port, we had exercised the crews in the manual, but not one of the mortars had been fired, and we were going to action, as I thought, blind. Considering my sea orders over, and uh, as I was a senior officer present, which every naval officer improves to command somebody, I thought I would assume command of myself and try the mortar in earnest. So we went through all the preparations for action, loaded the mortar with a full service charge of 20 pounds of powder, cut a fuse for 4,000 yards, and after several changes of sighting one side and then the other, I gave the order to fire. The crew, according to the manual, had been taught to stand in the rear of the piece on tiptoe, with mouth and ears open. But as this was real, I did not just know what the thing would do, I ordered them farther away, while I, with my officers, noted the time of flight of the shell and the time of sound from the explosion of the shell, after which I took a sur survey of the deck. The mortar had recoiled off the turntable back against the side, driving the rear of the carriage into the waterways and listing the vessel about 10 degrees. The concussion had taken nearly every door off the hinges, the arms, chests, and roundhouses collapsed, and, and um, other slight damage. Pat was the first to call attention. He stood fixed with his hands upon his hips, looking at the mortar carriage stuck in the waterway. Oh, howly Jesus, I wouldn't have been in hell of a fix if I had stayed where they told me. Sure, my legs would have been gone entirely. Such really would have been the case. For my discovery, I was awarded with a day off, and breachings were ordered to be fitted on the mortars of all the vessels. This heretofore had been deemed unnecessary. The commander of our division, in closing his report, alludes to this as follows. I have only to add that the vessels and mortars are now fitted, the preparation for action, and the service of the mortars made beforehand were ample, and did not require to be altered in the least during the bombardment, nor have any suggestions from the seven days actual service been made in the way of improvement, except, as a precaution, the breaching around the turntable. The shells weighed 216 pounds, contained 11 pounds of powder, and with a service charge of 20 pounds, fired at an angle of 45 degrees, the range was 4,200 yards. The mortars are generally fired at an angle of 45 degrees, so the charge is regulated by the distance of the object. One pound of powder will carry a 13-inch mortar shell 300 yards. The flight of a mortar shell being on a curved line is 3,000 yards in 25 seconds, 4,000 yards in 29 seconds, and 4,200 yards in 30 and a half seconds. The sound from the exploding shell will return at about 1,100 feet per second. A cannon shot being on a straight line will go 1,000 yards in 3 seconds and 2,000 yards in 7 seconds. The vessels were prepared for action by sending down top masts, unbending part of their sails, and coming up with fore rigging, etc. On the morning of the 18th, we were all anchored about five or six miles below the forts. The steamers belonging to the mortar flotilla were ordered to tow us into position. At 10 o'clock, the first were taken into position and immediately opened fire. The officers in command of the steamers were not accustomed to the towing business and made very slow work of it, so that some of us were left lying at anchor while the others were blazing away at the forts. About noon, I signaled my permission for permission to sail into action, which was granted, and I at once got underway, and with jib and mainsail having a fair wind, ran up and took my position at the head of the 3rd Division and opened fire. Just previous to reaching the position, we were ordered to anchor, a shell from Fort Jackson passed between our masts and stuck the water close to us. Our emerald friend again afforded much amusement to the crew by jumping behind the mortar, and when ridiculed for his dodging, gave this very good reason. Sure that bass is better to be taken than what I am. I have seen the time that I would like to have had just such a bass to get behind, but I always found it took more courage to dodge than to stand and take my chance. The vessels were anchored near the right bank of the river, a hawser run ashore from the bow and a spring line from the quarter, and thus moored an angle with the bank, their hulls were covered from the enemy by trees and bushes. The old order of things was changed during this action. The captain had to go aloft while Jack stayed below. When we began firing, I took my position at the main mast head, where I could see the forts and trace the flight of our shells, and did the sighting of the mortar at an elevation of about 70 feet above it. Different methods were adopted for this purpose on the various vessels. It was thought before we commenced that we could use a compass, and from the mast head give the course to fire, but the, the concussion unhung the compass card so that it was abandoned, and we, as was often the case, were left to our own resources. I adopted parallel bars, taking two pieces of scantling, the upper one I had on the cross trees, the other suspended from and parallel to that near the deck, weighed so as to keep it steady. 
I sighted and pointed the upper one for the fort, with the officer in charge on deck side the mortar by the lower one. When the mortar was fired, the little vessel would settle down in the water nearly a foot, careen over a streak or two, and shoot astern, bringing a heavy strain on the hawser and chain and switch us poor fellows to the masthead round, so that at times it was a question whether we would stay there or, like Dave Crockett's coon, come down. But the switching of our masts and the chance of a rebel shell were not our greatest discomfort upon this roost, for we were between two fires. Our vessels were more close together, each with her head a little offshore, so they each fired over the quarter of the one ahead. And as they fired at an angle of 45 degrees, the line of fire was not far from our positions at the ma main masthead. And I frequently felt the windage of the shell from the next in line, and the concussion was very severe upon us, even more than from our own, and more than once I felt the force of the expression. God save me from my friends. The commander of our division in his report said the masters commanding the different vessels of the division gave the direction of fire from the main masthead, regulating the charges used as required. They kept their post while engaged with scarce any relief, subject not only to the shock of their own mortars, but also from the one in the rear. We were kept under constant fire night and day for six long days. My poor men were so worn and sleepy that when we were firing only every twenty minutes, they would drop on deck and fall asleep, and the firing of the mortar in the rear would not disturb them, and nothing short of a kick would rouse them when it came our turn to fire. Admiral Porter, in his report, said, Overcome with fatigue, I have seen the commanders and crews lying fast asleep on deck, with a mortar on board the vessel next to them thundering away and shaking everything around them like an earthquake. To give some idea of what these twenty little vessels did in the week's bombardment, I'll give a brief report of the third division consisting of six vessels. They fired 415, 449, 460, 474, 478, and 493 shells, respectively, the latter my own vessel leading the fleet by 15 shells. The total fire was about 8,100 shells, weighing 1,728,000 pounds, and expending 250,000 pounds of powder. On the second day of the bombardment, the MJ Carlton was ordered from the left bank of the river to the right and drop in just the stern of my vessel. But as there happened to be a little more space, I slackened my chain and hawser and let him in ahead, he taking half my own place. He had not been there an hour when a shell struck his vessel, passing down through her magazine and sinking her in five minutes. But for my courtesy, my vessel instead of the Carlton would have been sunk. During the bombardment, many amusing incidents occurred, of which but a few can be mentioned here. Just as one of the mortars was being fired, a shell struck fair in the mortar and was fired back far enough before it exploded to clear the vessel, thereby doing no injury. Another mortar was struck in the face by a shell, which glanced off, doing no harm, leaving only a small indentation, proving what Pat had said in the beginning, that that bass was better able to take it than he was. My ship's cook had been to the side and drawn a bucket of water, which he was taking to the galley when a piece of shell, which I now have at home, struck his bucket, knocking it, as the printer would say, into P, not yet nobody was hurt. On the morning of the 24th, the fleet under Farragut started to pass the forts at about 3.30 o'clock. This is no doubt one of the most brilliant sights of the war. The vessels, 17 in number, carrying about 150 guns, the forts mounting 100 guns of various sizes, 20 13-inch mortars, and the steamers of the mortar flotilla, had engaged the lower or water battery, about 30 guns, say 300 heavy guns, with their exploding shells. The fire raft sent down the river by the rebels, and later on the blowing up of several rebel steamers, combined to making one of the grandest spectacle, spectacular scenes ever witnessed. The rebels had a chain across the river near the fort, supporting our hulks. Farragut wanted it removed, and sent an expedition to accomplish this object. In his report, he said Commander Porter, however, kept up such a tremendous fire on them from the mortars that the enemy shot did the gunboats no injury, and the cable was separated and their connections broken sufficiently to pass through on the left bank of the river. Commander Porter, in his detailed report of the capture of the forts of the Secretary of the Navy, adds, It would be an inter interminable undertaking, sir, if I were to attempt to give a minute minute account of all the hard work performed on the flotilla, or mention separately all the meritorious acts and patient endurance of the commanders and crews of the mortar vessels. All stuck to their duty like men and Americans, and though some may have exhibited more ingenuity and intelligence than others, yet the performance of all commanded my highest admiration. It is not generally known... But it is a fact, nevertheless, that Forts Jackson and St. Philip were surrendered the mortar flotilla, Article 4th of the capitulation being, On the signing of these articles by the contracting parties, the fort shall be formally taken possession of by the United States Naval Forces. Composing the mortar flotilla, the Confederate flag shall be lowered and the flag of the United States hoisted on the flagstaffs of Fort Jackson and St. Philip. It is very proper to mention the congratulatory letter from the Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, Commander D. Porter. Navy Department, May 10, 1862.
Sir, your dispatch of April 30th enclosing the articles of capitulation of Fort Jackson and St. Philip was surrendered on the 20th Ultimo after bombardment of 144 consecutive hours by the mortar flotilla has been received. I have also to acknowledge the receipt of the flags taken in the two forts on that occasion, including the original one hoisted on Fort St. Philip when the rebel forces declared the state of Louisiana to have succeeded from the Union, which had been sent forward to the department. The important part which you have borne in the organization of the mortar flotilla and the movement on New Orleans have identified your name with one of the most brilliant naval achievements on record, and to your able assistance with the flotilla is Flag Officer Farragut much indebted for the successful results he has accomplished. To yourself and the officers and the seamen of the mortar flotilla, the department extends its congratulations. I am respectfully, etc., Gideon Wells. Commander David D. Porter, commanding U.S. Military Mortar Flotilla, Gulf of Mexico. It was not my privilege to witness the final surrender, for on the day succeeding the passage of the force, the 25th of April, I received orders to have my vessel ready for sea in two hours, and sailed for Havana, carrying the reports of the passage of the force by Farragut's fleet. I also took with me the report that the New York Times, which was the first report published in New York City, I made a remarkably quick run of four days to Havana, and there intercepted the steamer Columbia and forwarded my dispatches to New York. The Cayuga arrived in Hampton Roads at the same time that the Columbia reached New York, but the bummer got in ahead, as he did in many cases in the Army during the Civil War.